Um, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, uh, dear colleagues, uh, most welcome to this uh, presentation today about uh, the RAND Center uh, for Middle East Public Policy about alternatives in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We have a roster of very competent commentators. Some all have been uh, associated with this uh, study. And uh, without further ado, I will pass the, the floor to Charlie Rees. But uh, before uh, I do that, uh, as soon as you want, you can enter your questions and your comments in the chat box. These comments and chat box will be collected um, and uh, then presented to the speakers. So Charlie, uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Mark, and thanks to the Egmont Institute for hosting us today. For decades, the Israelis and Palestinians have sought to find an alternative to continued conflict. But despite these efforts and high profile international engagement, the conflict persists. Today, I will be presenting Rand's new study on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, aimed at assessing whether there are any alternative solutions that average Israelis and Palestinians would support. Now, our study is the latest in a series of RAND reports on the Israeli-Palestinian conundrum. Earlier, we looked at what capabilities would be required to build a successful Palestinian state. We proposed planning ideas for, Palesti for a Palestinian state constructed along an arc between West Bank and Gaza, and we examined the macroeconomic costs of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. This new report was sponsored by a generous gift from Peter and Carol Richards. In the study, we set out to answer three fundamental questions. First, are any possible alternative futures for the Israeli-Palestinian relationship potentially acceptable to average Israelis and Palestinians? Second, if none of the alternatives are acceptable, what types of modifications to the proposals might make them more viable? And third, what types of actions can the international community take, if any, to support a peaceful resolution to the conflict? Our analysis focused on five possible stylized alternative futures for the conflict. We selected the five to cover the range of possible ideas that have been floated. The first of the alternatives is simply the perpetuation of today's status quo. The second alternative is the two-state solution, the international community's preferred alternative for decades. The third is a confederation with independent and sovereign states cooperating upon agreed issues of mutual interest by way of federal institutions. The fourth would be unilateral Israeli annexation of all of the West Bank's area C. And the fifth alternative is a democratic one state solution. Full details on how we define these alternatives are in our report and its annex. I should note that on January 26th, the United States told the UN Security Council that under the Biden administration, the policy of the United States will be to support a mutually agreed two state solution one in which Israel lives in peace and security alongside a viable Palestinian state. But in his uh, confirmation hearing, uh, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken admitted that the uh, prospect of such a solution is very challenged. Now we used a focus group approach to examine attitudes of the various communities. Focus groups were based on Rand's Delphi method. Our approach, which was designed to complement ex extensive ex uh, existing polling efforts by others, has two unique characteristics. First, to ensure that we were capturing informed perspectives on the alternatives, each focus group began with a 45 minute discussion of the five alternatives. Second, we collected both quantitative and highly textured qualitative data, which allowed us to assess the vi viability of the alternatives. In all, we held 33 focus groups uh, involving 273 individuals. The groups were roughly evenly split in terms of men and women, except for the groups with ultra-Orthodox Israelis where all the participants were men. Our research produced three key policy relevant findings. And as I go through them, a few of the relevant quotes from the policy groups, uh, from the focus groups will be on the screen, although I won't read them. Our first key finding is that getting Israeli Jews to support any alternative to the st status quo will require a shift in both domestic and international politics. Right now, the status quo is the preferred alternative for Israeli Jews. In our focus groups, many participants were satisfied with the sat status quo and others stated it was manageable and preferable to the risk of the alter uh, other alternatives. 
Indeed, only a small group on the political left rejected it altogether. We found that among Israeli Jews, there are two major impediments to the other alternatives. The first was a lack of trust in Palestinian objectives. The lack of trust results in fear, xenophobia, and a willingness to forego basic principles of democracy when it comes to the rights of the Palestinians. Also, it uh, leads to a strong desire, even among those on the political left, to separate from the Palestinians and avoid any governance or living arrangements that might bring the two groups together. The second impediment, which is closely related to the first, is that there was a general belief among all Israeli Jews that none of the other alternatives were feasible. As a result, this of the, as a result of this perceived lack of feasibility, the status quo is better than the alternatives. While the two-state solution might be preferred by center-left Israelis in principle, a separation into two states is deemed infeasible because Palestinians are not considered to be able to be a partner for peace. Similarly, although annex, annexation of Area C might be preferred by the right, many state that it was in, infeasible because it would not be tolerated by the international community. But despite a, a preference for the status quo, our research also demonstrated, as others have before us, that there is substantial conceptual report, support for the two-state solution among Israeli Jews. Indeed, our, our quantitative data suggests that the two-state solution and the status quo have roughly the same level of support in this Jewish community, as you can see by the red arrows on the, uh, the stack columns on the slide. What might be done to help convince Israeli Jews to support the two-state solution? While security and economic considerations are important, we found that governance is the most important factor in determining Israeli Jewish support for the different alternatives. In the focus groups, we define governance as the ability to have a say in political decisions that are important to you. Our second key finding is that Palestinians will need to require, will likely require international security guarantees for any peaceful resolution to the conflict to succeed. Overall, Palestinians in our discussions were unsatisfied with all five of the alternatives. All were seen as biased against them, primarily serving the interests of the more powerful Israelis while asking for compromises from the Palestinians. This is true even of the two-state solution, as you can see in the quote. However, while unwilling to accept any of the alternatives, Palestinians were motivated to find a viable alternative to the status quo. They expressed an urgent need for change to address the living conditions they face, in particular unemployment, security threats, education needs, water shortages, and a general lack of agency. Some expressed frustrations aimed at their leaders, but most blamed Israel for the difficult status quo. While Palestinians were unwilling to endorse any of the five alternatives, our research suggests that they would be willing to accept a modified two-state solution. Palestinians sought an independent state with geographic contiguity, political autonomy, standing army to defend itself, and control over the borders. Like the Israelis, their strongest motivating imperative was separation. Thus, while our data suggests that there is substantial support for the two-state solution among West Bank Palestinians, as you can see by the red arrow, they are, in our view, indicating support for a modified view, a version of the two-state solution. Interestingly, Gazan Palestinians were most supportive of the one-state solution. They were deeply skeptical that the divide between Gaza and the West Bank, economically, geographically, and politically, could be bridged by the two-state solution and indicated that they believed that only a one-state solution could bring the much-needed improvements in living conditions for them. Our research suggested that previous analyses may have undervalued the importance of personal security and legal predictability to Palestinians in determining the viability of possible alternative futures. For West Bankers, security was the, by far the most important factor in determining support for different alternatives. And for Gazans, security and economics were rated as equally important. Our second policy finding, therefore, is that a two-state solution might be more attractive to the Palestinians if it were supported by international security guarantees as well as economic assistance. While the, the two-state solution that the Palestinians desire would most likely not be acceptable to Israel, a two-state solution in which the international community made credible commitments to guarantee Palestinian security could be more viable. Now, our third key policy finding is that educating Israelis and Palestinians about alternatives may lead to more pragmatic 
decision making. Now, this is a bit of an unexpected finding for us and requires some explanation. As I mentioned, our focus groups started with a brief overview of the five different alternatives. We adopted this approach when our pre-testing showed that few participants in group discussions started with any clear understanding of any of the five alternatives. Our method sought to ensure that all participants were on the same page when the discussion shifted into the assessment of these alternatives. In the end, a number of participants commented that the resulting rich conversations allowed them to make more informed decisions about their preferred alternatives, and some stated that they ended up supporting a different alternative as a result. Uh, this, thus, our research suggested an information campaign educating in individuals about all the alternatives will likely be an important component of efforts to promote peaceful resolution in the current conflict. Now, in addition to these three policy findings, our study provides a range of other insights that may help guide policymakers. One of these insights stems from our request that participants rank order the priority issues. In this slide, we summarize the issue rankings of Israeli Jews. There's a lot going on here, but I'd like to highlight a couple of things. First, maintaining Israel as a Jewish state is the most important issue for Israeli Jews. Second, Israel's Jewish character, democratic nature, and external security are by far the most important factors, suggesting that there may be room to negotiate on other issues. This slide provides an analogous rank ordering for Palestinians. While Jerusalem was the highest rank issue overall, the chart shows the importance of security to them that I mentioned earlier. It also suggests one reason why previous peace efforts focused on economic dividends have been so ineffective as economics ranked last overall. Now our key goal was to determine whether there were areas of overlap in feelings and opinions among Israelis and Palestinians that might offer new avenues for negotiation leading the parties closer to peace. Sadly, the data show the opposite. The data highlight the deep distrust and profound animosity of each side for the other. Now, this is unquestionably a sobering finding, although perhaps unsurprising given the history of the conflict. But our research also highlighted some pathways forward. First and foremost, the research suggests that peace deals need to be more holistic than they have been. While previous deals have focused on economic dividends, the international community has shied away from the security guarantees that could help find common ground between these two peoples. Similarly, objective and careful discussions of the alternatives with all communities may help build support for creativity and compromise. We hope that in the coming years, Israelis, Palestinians, and the international community will have the courage to make the commitments and sacrifices to resolve what has been one of the world's most difficult political challenge. The full text of our report is posted at the rand.org website, the address you see on the screen. It elaborates on these findings and many others as well. The report includes chapters deeply diving into the views of each of the communities, allowing the focus group participants to speak directly to the reader, including quotes you've seen today and many others like them. My colleagues and I now would be happy to discuss our findings in the context of the bigger issues. Thank you, Charlie. A very good presentation. I, I think uh, it's a never ending story, and, uh, but you've added a lot of uh, very relevant uh, comment to that. And the study that I've read uh, is a very relevant and uh, is, is clearly a, a good support for policymakers should they uh, want to get down to the problem again. I forgot to say that you're, uh, you were vice president of RAND and uh, that you're now a senior fellow, uh, uh, but also a former diplomat who has a, quite a great professional experience. So, uh, does Ross wants to add comments to this? I think Ross is right. gone. No, 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 thank you, Mark. No, not at this time. I think Charlie did a, a great job of summarizing the, uh, the study and uh, the rest of us will be glad to take uh, questions when we get to that point. Okay. Uh, Dr. Ross Anthony is director of RAND, Israeli-Palestinian Initiative, and I've had the pleasure to work with him in the past. Uh, he has uh, really uh, 
a pillar of uh, this uh, uh, program and this uh, this report, uh, like the other reports that uh, preceded it. So uh, let me turn now to Dr. Shenlin uh, of the Middle East Institute. Uh, Dr. Shenlin, you want to make some comment? Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, just, uh, just a correction, I'm uh, a fellow with the Century Foundation. Uh, although oh, okay. I have written occasionally, it's okay. I have written occasionally at the Middle East Institute. I like, I love both of them. Uh, just tell me how long do I have? Because I have so many comments on this excellent report. Okay, well, uh, do everything you can to be brief, but uh, be complete also. Okay, I will be comprehensive. First of all, I really want to congratulate you on a very comprehensive and very necessary undertaking. There, is, there, is, there are many alternatives out there floating around in different circles. And so I think it's very important that you brought them together and assess them in a systematic way. So first of all, it's really a service and I'm happy to have uh, been involved in it. Um, I want to start with one of the main uh, findings that is really does plague this region, which is the imbalance between Israelis who are comfortable with the status quo and Palestinians who are not. Just to point out that, um, I mean, this is also touching on methodology, that in, survey, in the survey research that you draw on very richly, um, the Israeli-Palestinian joint survey, we also have a finding that the status quo is preferred from a list of options by only 13 or 14 percent respectively, Palestinians and Israelis, when compared with other options. And it's important to keep that in mind, not because it's extremely hopeful, but because the other preferred options are increasingly hardline options. So we have to like, you know, kind of um, complement your finding with the reality that for those who are prepared to give up on the status quo on the Israeli side, many times they're going towards a hardline maximalist position. And on the Palestinian side, you know, reverting back to supporting struggle of some sort, armed or unarmed. Uh, that's an important finding. And that brings me to something that I wanna say about the methodology. I'm a big fan of focus groups. Uh, they add enormous dimension. And, you know, when you quantify them, naturally you get some different results from survey research because they're not representative samples. They are, they have a nice N, you have 273 people, but they're not weighted according to the actual representation. And that does not diminish from the invaluable input of understanding the depth and that you've come, you know, you've come up with contributions because you've opened up those conversations. But I do think it's interesting when they overlap with survey research and a few places where they differ to keep our eyes on it because sometimes those differences can tell us things that the survey research is not picking up on for whatever reason. Um, and now when there's very small variations, you know, you have a slight majority of Israelis supporting the two-state solution in our joint Palestinian-Israeli research, we have um, almost a majority, but below 50%. When there's a slight difference, I'd probably go with the statistical representation. But one of the areas of distinction is that you showed, you found more support on the Palestinian side for one state solution, one equal state, um, and you, uh, propose that the survey research is underestimating support for one state, which is very intuitive. Anybody who's had conversations in this region knows that many Palestinians express support for one state. I've always had that question in my mind in the quantitative research. Are we picking this up? Is there some normative you know, perception that you're not supposed to talk about support for one state? If you've picked up on something that the survey research is not picking up on, how do we understand it in greater depth? Should we be fleshing out our survey research to quantify what aspects of one state we may be um, not picking up on? Now, uh, I know I'm kind of just moving down my list of comments and I'll continue trying to be somewhat concise. Um, I think that uh, like any public opinion research, you know, you, uh, despite the fact that you did it over the course of some period of time, which is important, we are looking at a moment in time, even if that moment is a year. And I think that there's a lot of depth in this survey for thinking about not just the picture of where we have been over the course of the year you're doing the research, but how to change attitudes. Um, I know, I don't think it was, well, you did have a strategic goal of finding the overlap. Okay, you didn't find so much overlap. I don't think it's surprising. The two have very different experiences, but there's plenty that you can glean from the work that you've done to think about what can be added to future uh, attempts to move ahead. 
And you've pointed out some of the most important ones. I want to uh, embellish on them. One is the point about security for Palestinians being one of the top issues. That was very interesting to me. I've seen that in survey research as well. And I think that it is fundamentally underappreciated by most of the policy and public discourse on this conflict. It's always Israel who has security concerns. Uh, it's Israel who has security fears, threats, uh, you know, ground floor conditions. And I think that we don't really internalize that Palestinians suffer from security fears. And as a result, we don't truly know what they are. What are they afraid of? Are they afraid of you know, having homes demolished or being uh, the target of uh, military violence or settler violence? Uh, or as I suspect, maybe in addition, is their fear of a broader nature? When they say security fear, what they really mean is that any of the solutions on the table, which your study found they weren't terribly enthusiastic about, looks too much to them like some form of permanent occupation. And if that's the case, I think that we need to understand that in depth, think about what could you know, um, begin to dismantle those fears and not to treat them as like a psychological problem, but a policy problem. So that's another thing. Um, certainly the issue of governance on the Israeli side is interesting. Um, I suspect, you know, I'm reading into this a little bit, but I'm a little concerned that when Israelis say, yes, our primary concern is governance, <clears throat> what they mean is sovereignty. Okay. I don't know how deeply your conversations went, if you were able to pull that out. But I mean, this is what happens when I talk to the more hardline Israelis. They, they talk about governance, but what they really mean is we need to be the ones in control, fundamentally. So we have to think about that as an obstacle. But of course, I do want to also emphasize your point um, that the research suggests that an information campaign, education campaign can change minds. I don't want us to gloss over this. I'm glad you highlighted it. But the point is that some of these alternatives, including the one that I openly have written in support of, but the other ones too, could develop more support the more people know about them. Um, some of them are a little bit new and the more people are familiar with them, that will certainly change minds. Um, when we talk about trust gestures, on the other hand, I think that they have to be concrete. You know, the, the problem of lack of trust came up here too. And I get, I'm getting edgy in recent years talking about the problem of trust as if it starts within people's minds. It doesn't start within people's minds, really. I think it starts with people's experiences. Sure, for some of them, the experiences may be mediated through politicians, political rhetoric, media. But we have to, I don't, I don't I'm becoming increasingly skeptical that just saying we have a trust problem is enough. It's people's experiences that are the problem. Um, and I think what I wanna do is uh, end with uh, a few very specific points that came out of some of the specific findings and I really will try to wrap this up quickly. I'm sorry if I'm speaking too fast. Um, the point about separation, I still think it's a little more complex. Okay, the, the finding that essentially the two sides want separation is already belied by the fact that, you know, uh, that the Israeli right would love to have uh, annexation of Area C. Well, that means another 300,000 Palestinians, you know. Um, and Palestinians, of course, you know, I don't remember exactly what uh, rank this was, but, you know, need economic opportunities. Those economic opportunities don't come with full separation. So I still, you know, the reasons why I have come to be a, a supportive of a two state confederation approach is because I think when people think about separation, it's like an ideal. But when it comes to day-to-day -day life, uh, the conveniences and the needs of the two different sides, they don't truly, they wouldn't really be able to um, accept what total separation would mean. And I like your two bubbles where they're completely not touching. So I just think we have a few examples of that. And I would question it. I would just keep an eye out on it, let's say. Uh, I already mentioned the point about uh, support for one state. Um, and then in terms of the Palestinian uh, modified two-state solution, I think that's an opening. The idea that Palestinians might be prepared to accept a modified two-state solution, but I would be curious to know what it really means. You have a few initial ideas. What I wasn't clear on is what what, what compromises would they be willing to make in that framework, and on the Israeli side too. Um, in general, I think we need to do more. You know, neither side is in the mood to compromise. That's why we're finding such hard hardline results. And fundamentally, when the two sides get together, that's where they get stuck. How far can you compromise? So I think we have to start getting back to an idea that says, you know, are you willing to give up on 
you know, X, Y, Z in order to get to any of these overall solutions. Um, the last uh, very small technical, well, not a technical question. Uh, when you were searching for common ground between them, I noticed that in the ranked priorities of what's important to each side, on the Israeli side, in, uh, having a democratic state ranked very high. It ranked second in your list. But on the Palestinian side, I didn't even see that option unless I missed it, but I read it several times to find out. Now, I would like to propose that the idea of building a democratic Palestinian society is more important for Palestinians than the surveys sometimes show because it has something to do with the way it's asked. We have found that it's an important incentive in our joint survey research for supporting, uh, for those who are opposed to a two-state solution to begin supporting it on the Palestinian side if they think it's going to be democratic. I think that should be part of the conversation more. And I think it's convincing to Israelis to think that they might be going into some sort of political resolution with a democratic society. So I'd like to turn more attention to that. Um, and I think that for follow-up research, since you just published an enormous undertaking, your next research might think about what are the immediate steps that need to be put into place to build the conditions that would serve any future resolution. Because we don't know now if we're looking at two separate states, one state, confederation, federation, anything. But I think that there are, even if the public doesn't realize it, there, I think that there are certain policies that can be put into place that would serve all of those uh, frameworks. And then we can look at those and see if the public would accept those steps that at least can be started quickly. And I, I, I could go into them and I have many in mind, but I don't wanna take up all of the time. Thank you. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, bright expose. And uh, can I uh, continue to require that people send their questions to the chat box so we are ready when uh, the other speakers are finished to start the conversation. Um, now, uh, can I ask uh, Malik Tahlan to come in? Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for uh, including me in this discussion and uh, my congratulations to Ambassador Reese and the team at RAND uh, for, uh, for putting the uh, long-awaited uh, uh, report together and thanks to the Egmont pro uh, Group for, for launching um, this effort. I come uh, to the conversation having participated uh, in, in the report's discussions as a, a negotiator and a mediator, but more importantly, from a uh, bringing a regional uh, perspective um, as I come from Saudi Arabia as an international mediator. And as you can appreciate, there was a time where it was absolutely taboo to have any regional uh, um, sort of participation from an academic perspective, let alone political. So uh, as was mentioned, this comes as a, as a part of a long uh, history at RAND with uh, projects or, or reports, including the ARC and the COST, um, that, that anchors conversations that someone like me, who's been a part of track two diplomacy uh, since 2002, when the Arab Peace Initiative was launched, um, it, it, it gave us for the first time, and I think perhaps not the first time, but certainly gave us a, a texture of the comments of the, of the focus group. And, and that in itself created a lot of value for someone like me who thinks about um, negotiation sequencing and, uh, and process design. Um, also an important point is the timing. I think, it, it, it was, there were a lot of initiatives taking place at the time uh, during which this uh, report uh, was being developed. Um, we all know the, the concept of facts on the ground, which were changing and continue to be changing and certainly in extreme ways, including uh, the meaning of annexation or negotiations in the region. Uh, the targets have been moving, so, so not only was the, uh, uh, the idea of alternatives, but were we even looking at alternatives during these discussions? Um, new plans and new agendas. We, we know about the, uh, the Trump plan, the peace to prosperity uh, plan, and, and the idea of uh, changing the interests uh, internally, uh, as in focusing on the internal discussions to getting regional players involved. Um, 
and the idea that annexation can be given some sort of value to be bargained with or negotiated. Um, those are all, I think, important um, points that the report helped anchor or think about. Um, and I have no doubt in my mind, like myself, many others have been looking at, at um, or waiting for something that is more conclusive to consider. And like every fantastic grand report, it's really up to you to, to really digest the data and understand how it works. And that's why Dahlia is, is very <laughs> helpful in the way she presents and, and, and helps us think about this. I think what, what is also important is um, the level of fatigue, which we've all reached. And I think everyone accepts, not only negotiators, Israelis and Palestinians themselves, but anyone who, who was interested in the topic, it, it's just uh, cerebrally, it's very difficult to follow or understand what is being said anymore. It, it's, and I think it kind of Iran gave this credible opportunity to, to think about the alternatives again. Um, and I think that is something that we shouldn't ignore. I think it connects also to the point that was mentioned earlier about, we shouldn't view this as a normative expression, right? These are all experiential. This is, this is something real that causes us to reach this conclusion. Uh, from an international point, law point of view, the idea of statehood or self-determination also kicks in, in a very important and real way. This is fundamentally about governance, but nonetheless also about what is appropriate or legitimate under international law, which has been a topic of great controversy. And I think that being measured or again, measured against uh, uh, the comments is very helpful. So, you know, for example, the accusation or uh, uh, the, the, the description of a state being an apartheid state or not, um, the idea of confederacy, the idea of this all belongs to a, a, a long uh, history of state creation and state uh, uh, the birth and the afterlife of states. And I think the idea of statehood fundamentally has been challenged in the whole of the Middle East, whether you look at Iraq, Syria, and so on, or even uh, uh, ISIS um, for that matter. So uh, what was being sort of revered as a, a Jewish state versus non-Jewish state, but this brings us back to what is a state fundamentally under international law. So the presentation and methodology, I think, will help further conversations and the proposed next discussion, uh, next reports, uh, and certainly establishes that we, uh, that, that ran, this is the beginning of a conversation, not the end. Just a few comments on negotiations and expectations. Um, obviously, uh, this comes at a perfect time as a new administration comes in. Uh, part of it leaves us with a sigh of relief that not, you know, that a generalized uh, Trump plan or other plans are, are not the end sort of result. So it gives a bit of breathing space to negotiate something that is more uh, credible and more uh, achievable. Uh, it gives us new ways of thinking about things. Uh, we've noticed that Jerusalem was at the top of the agenda. Certainly there has been discussions about how can you give uh, international guarantees through such, uh, uh, so such giving agency to, to Jerusalem, not just as a capital of a state, but rather a space with which international players can, um, can engage. We also now understand that new players are going to be part of this discussion, the regional dimension, as we saw from what is called uh, the Abrahamic Accords, that there is an expectation for guarantees, not only by the traditional mediators, to what extent can they help facilitate those discussions? Um, the new narratives, I think that is going to be important, perhaps for the psychological or, or, or the perceived uh, um, um, trust issues. Uh, we've moved now from a world that views the Arabs as, a, as, a, as an enemy or an animosity to more about the Palestinians, the Gazans, and those distinctions, I think, and the subtleties could be dangerous, but also are very helpful for us to unpack some of the uh, historical uh, and attitudinal uh, complexities. 
Um, I do think there is also a new expected role for international players, which, which, which is important. Uh, this is the major focus group uh, is focusing in the immediate space, but it helps international uh, players understand where is it or that they can contribute and make a, 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 an impact. So, for example, uh, the idea of naming something like the Abrahamic Accord, uh, Abrahamic, was really using the idea of an ecumenical space, which was Jerusalem, to sort of move it away from the political contestation. So that in itself, I think, is a new ground for us to start thinking about these alternatives. Finally, in terms of policy uh, implications, I do think that, um, that we've noticed new trends of looking at the Israeli-Palestinian conflict rather than just that, that conflict that, that is plaguing the Middle East. It's now seen as something that perhaps uh, new attitudes and negotiations like outside in, you know, dealing with the region, then dealing with other opportunities, the economic opportunities. And we've already seen those costs and political economic considerations in previous uh, RAND uh, reports. So I do hope that that continues, including um, really, I guess, Dali has put it as the, the, the conditions. And I would sort of add to that, the sort of the negotiation sort of architecture that helps us to get there. So um, it's, a, it's a toolkit, if you may, for the future. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It was uh, very complimentary to uh, what was said uh, by Dr. Shenling. And uh, thank you also for raising the winds of change in the region. Uh, the Abrahamic Accord, the, uh, the, there have been good winds, there have been the less good winds, like uh, the decision to uh, uh, move the embassy, the US embassy to Jerusalem. Uh, but there are, there are new problems also that require cooperation uh, without which uh, uh, the problems will not be solved. There's no win-win situation like climate, water, and the, these kind of issues. Thank you for uh, giving us this uh, wise advice. And uh, I, I hope that we'll see the, if the questions uh, relate to that too. Uh, I now turn to uh, see if there are, uh, to, to our people, to see if there are questions already. And Jeffrey, are there, uh, are there questions that uh, you, you might regroup? I think you can proceed uh, with them chronologically if you like. Okay, well, could you, could you frame the question then? I'll you wanna pose them, Jeff? Sure. Uh, one question is, uh, would demography trends make it possible for the one state solution to be at the same time the Jewish state and the democracy many Israeli Jews want their country to be? Um, uh, Ross uh, is yeah, probably no, most I, eloquent I, on that question. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll try to speak to that. I mean, um, you know, if you look at the dem demography in the area, um, it's, you know, there's arguments about exactly what it is, and uh, we don't want to go into that, but it, it's about equal if you look at the, um, uh, the population from the Jordan River to the, to the, to the Mediterranean. Um, some some one-state solutions have postulated not having Gaza included, in which case there would be a, um, a, a lot more, um, about, I think, 30 to 40 percent uh, uh, Arabs in, in that state. So it's possible to have one state, but I, that could be uh, legally that. But uh, I think as Palestinians look at it, uh, once you uh, have that kind of demography, there is certainly uh, most Israelis do not uh, trust that they would have continue to be ha having a Jewish state. So yes, it definitely would be threatened uh, uh, in, in most situations. Thank um, you. Uh, but sorry, you want to, to add something? I know. I just wanted to add one more thing about what uh, um, Dr. Shinlin had said uh, about uh, conf uh, her work on confederation versus a two-state solution. And um, interestingly enough, um, people didn't really understand a confederation. And it's it's a complement. It, it is a bit complicated, particularly for people who are not used to the concepts. But interestingly enough, a lot of the issues that the Palestinians were seeking. 
um, to change when they talked about two-state solution actually kind of morphed into what a confederation is. So uh, th there is more overlap with those two concepts than uh, one might imagine. I just wanted to point that out. Okay, thank you. Could we, could we hear a little bit more about what kinds of things you have in mind? Just one or two examples, because that would be interesting. Um, I'll, I'll give one and then I'll let uh, uh, Daniel and Shira, who are actually in the focus groups, uh, give one. Um, you know, we, we have at this point uh, hundreds of thousands of settlers on the West Bank. It's, it's probably not practical to think you're going to, to eliminate all of them and, and have a two state solution that's based on the 1967 borders and ask all the uh, settlers to move. But confederations usually postulate that uh, people living in the various areas could be uh, citizens of another state. So the settlers could in fact be citizens of Israel, but live in the, in the, on the West Bank or, or Palestine and be considered uh, citizens where they would have to obey the law. So those, those kinds of aspects of uh, what are commonly thought to be in a confederation might be really um, helpful uh, in looking at a two-state solution that it in fact is viable and feasible. Shira, Shira, you want to come in at this point? Sorry, no, I actually had other uh, thoughts about uh, what Dahlia said earlier, um, and I don't have to be uh, long uh, on this if, if that's acceptable. Um, I just also, I think we need to acknowledge Dahlia that not only she has her own credentials, but she was the peer reviewer of the study, a very uh, a constructive, very tough peer reviewer. She made the study much better. Uh, you should see my students. <laughs> <laughs> they don't survive. Um, but I think, and it has to do with you know, you speak about those issues of being a Jewish majority, of being in control. It goes to what Dahlia started with, which is the big imbalance between the two sides, which mm -hmm. lets Israelis, even though in surveys and when actually when they walked into the, the um, folks groups rooms, these were discussions for four hours. No one said they liked the status quo. It was sort of evolved. As you presented the alternatives, they said, well, you know what, actually the situation is not that bad. So we'll keep it, which of course for the Palestinians is not attainable at all. So I think, I think these are all the discussions that we have to um, understand that are happening and, it's, and they're all born by this, by this imbalance. Uh, if I could just make a point that is uh, referring to what Dali said also, uh, when he talks specifically about the Confederation, which is interesting, but also on the other alternatives, it's very possible that lack of knowledge is an issue. We were also surprised to find that there's lack of knowledge on other issues. Whereas we, the policy one community, right? We all know where area A and area B and area C is. Those stuff which Israelis don't know it. And the Palestinians that know it is because they have to transfer from one area to another and it changes their life. But at the level of knowledge, Palestinians, and this is something that Charlie should have focused um, on, um, the, 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 the notion that their leaders have negotiated and agreed to a non-militarized state. This was a symbol of sovereignty. And they're like, what? We didn't know that. We, it's, it's impossible. Um, so I think there was not basic lack of knowledge on, on the known things. And then when it came to the um, less known options, um, and I don't want to call them alternatives, they're not all of them are solutions, right? Continuation of the status quo is an outcome, it's not a solution. Um, there was a lot of, uh, it's interesting because we're speaking with Europe now, uh, Confederation, people were in the room like that, what? This is not Europe here, this will never work. Um, it could be that if this becomes something that leadership starts talking about on both sides, it will change, it will change things. But as a concept, um, there was no eagerness for more uh, contact. It was the contact issue. It wasn't dividing, it wasn't sharing Jerusalem. It's the idea that more contact it could lead to more friction. And this is not, maybe it's, uh, we call it lack of trust, but there was so, it was so depressing to be in this focus groups, both the Israelis and the Palestinians, because the level of fear and dehumanization of the other side um, was so deep entrenched and I think this is part of part of um, the, part, part of I mean our conclusion is also that you know those people to people activities that maybe they're not needed but, and maybe they're not scalable uh, but they could lead to a change in atmosphere. Um, this is uh, this and the last 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 point uh, that Dalia you also spoke about when the Palestinians every uh, alternative every every option they thought about as prolonged occupation. And when we try to say, they kept talking about fear. 
and you 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 hit the nail right 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 at it because they kept talking about like the settlers and the IDF and we're like wait no but in the two state solution you will have your own state the settlers will not be there the IDF will not be there they're like no no this will never happen they will find a way to be there they will continue to raid our uh, cities um, so thank you Shira yes uh, and uh, I I was struck uh, reading the the book that. Uh, a lot of people didn't understand what alternatives were uh, in, in depth and that uh, you had probably uh, the merit of the, the, the groups that you put together was to uh, increase their knowledge about what expecting them in terms of uh, uh, consequences in one or the other solution. Thank you very much. Can I go back to uh, another question? Sure. There are two that get into regional actors, one asking in general about the role of regional actors. Another question is asking about the old proposal of a confederation of Palestine with Jordan, if that's still something to consider. Okay. Yeah, we often, we often get that question um, uh, in talking about this, uh, and it, it's usually posed, uh, well, you guys, you talked about a special kind of federation that you forgot about the Jordan Federation, uh, and uh, Ross uh, has, has handled this before, but basically we decided, uh, first of all, we were interested in keeping the number of alternatives manageable. So if we had seven or eight or nine alternatives, you don't, even in a four hour conversation, you can't really get it, probe them in depth. But secondly, we decided not to pose um, a confederation with Jordan, either as a separate alternative or as a sub alternative of confederation because the Jordanians are pretty clear uh, and Malik may have something to say on this as well, but they're, they're pretty clear and consistent that they're not interested in, in participating in such a thing. And so we wanted um, alternatives that, that were at least plausible and didn't have such a, uh, an obstacle. Thank you. Uh, next question. Did the focus groups include any Israelis living in Area C? Was the issue of how to manage the 700,000 Israeli settlers already living there discussed in the context of any of the proposed solutions? Shira? I'm sorry, can, can you, um, Jeff, was, was the question if, if, this, if we had in the groups a representative settlers? That's part of it. Did we, did, yeah, did we include any yeah. Israelis who were living in Area C? Yeah, yeah. And then so, so we, 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 I don't have exact information of where everyone was living, but we definitely, in the Jewish-Israeli groups, we had uh, data on the parties to which they, for which they voted. And there were, uh, they did, and they, they did identify as uh, religious Zionists and having voted for Naftali Bennett's party at the time, which suggests uh, strong support for the settler movement. Um, I, so let me, thank you. let me just make a, a general comment. It, we, uh, w when we do these kinds of studies, we operate on the uh, highest um, principles mm -hmm. of uh, 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 participant uh, human subjects protection uh, so that we don't have the names we don't have the addresses of the participants. We, uh, we rely on third parties to help recruit the groups. Uh, and then we destroy all identifying data uh, on the participants in order to protect their privacy. And we do that in the United States when we do uh, work on the Obamacare uh, as well. I mean, it's not, it's not specific to this, but this, uh, these kinds of studies where they get into uh, politically controversial subjects, if you had uh, a data file that involved personally identifiable information, first of all, we would violate EU uh, 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 GDPR rules, but more, more broadly, we would, it would not be consistent with the way that we treat these things. Thank you. Another and, question? And if I could answer John, I think Jonathan's question uh -huh actually slightly different because he was asking about you know how the settlers in area c were discussed in the focus groups and i would say you know we talk about them in great depth in the report for each of the five alternatives that we present we use you know existing proposals uh, and to the point that dolly and Shira raised you know there's a lot of discussion around the, what this meant for the alternatives was this feasible you know we would say you know the the confederation example 
allowed settlers to remain uh, in a Palestinian state. And you know, a lot of people said, well, that sounds really nice. That's totally infeasible. Um, that's totally impractical. The IDF is gonna be here. Um, and so anyways, you know, it, uh, we talk about that in great depth in the report. I encourage you to take a look at how we've defined um, each of the alternatives, which is based on you know, Dolly's work and many other uh, great scholars in this domain. Um, and then we'd be happy to follow up if you have any additional questions. Okay, thank you. Let's look at the rest of the questions, or at least the following one. Jeff? Sure. You're right. Uh, You're one, Jeff. I think I'm in now. Uh, yeah. Is Israel really? Yeah, 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 you have it. Is Israel really a democratic state? Can the Israeli authorities continue to deal with abuse and mistreatment of Palestinian citizens without consequence or follow up? Can a serious discussion of new understanding and rights for the two peoples take place while more land is ta uh, being taken for settlers and settlers can engage in criminal and faulty action with no fear? Uh, well, it's can a, I have a, a moment on that whenever you're ready? Yeah, go, for it. go for it, Daya. <laughs> oh, no, I wasn't trying to usurp you. No, no. I wasn't trying to let you off the hook. No, no, no. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, Daya. Um, I think that we are used to seeing Israel as sort of the, the paradigmatic, you know, democracy in the region and everybody else is of a lesser de democratic, uh, you know, measure. And that's true that the other, you know, that certainly the Palestinians and the other uh, states are less democratic. But I think that we should, just as I said, we should not take for granted that democracy is not mm -hmm. an issue among the Palestinians, which I argued before. I think it needs to be on the table as an incentive for Palestinians. But I also think it should not be taken for granted on the Israeli side. Uh, Israel, we, we probably overestimate Israel's democracy from 1948. I could point out any number of very severe beyond flaws, like actual you know, structural problems with Israeli democracy. But the fact is we are seeing an erosion over the last decade or so in various ways. And I think that they are not, it's not a coincidence. You know, again, you could say, well, Israel's erosion is because it has a populist leader like other national populist, you know, nationalist populist leaders, um, or maybe because its democracy was shaky to begin with. But I think that the real reason is because Israel is weakening the democratic mechanisms in place to challenge policies of annexation. And so I think that if we don't take Israel's democratic culture for granted, which is why it's a good question, but recommit to strengthening a rebuilding democracy, both on the Palestinian side and on the Israeli side, it will probably set us, like it will probably lead us towards solutions that are grounded in some shared democratic principles that protect civil and human rights, which right now, those are being undermined because they're being undermined in Israel, which sets Israel up pretty well to say, well, we don't need them anywhere. We control this region, civil and human rights, eh. They've been, we've been eroding them at home anyway. Uh, so I, I would just, I, I think it's a good question. And I think that I would put democracy back on the table for Palestinians and for Israel. I agree with what you said in the, in the context, uh, in this context, I, I read that uh, Hamas and Fatah seems to be in agreement now about the uh, elections. And uh, so it's, uh, it's something to watch. Uh, uh, we have celebrated uh, the last Palestinian elections as being democratic and uh, then don't, didn't follow the, uh, the logic of that completely uh, in 2006. So uh, I think it's a very important question. Malik, you wanted to come in? Yeah. Uh, just a, a qu although I have to say this last uh, point is very, very intriguing. Um, on, on the Jordan Confederation point, um, I, I think it, it's important to remember that uh, King Hussein, uh, the late King Hussein incorporated this point in, in the constitution early 80s. So it's no longer an option from that perspective. However, where, where things come through from the Jordanian side is, is the peace treaty between Jordan and, and Israel, where Jordan's um, uh, monarchy, the Hashemites, are uh, uh, designated as custodians of, mm -hmm. of Haram al-Sharif. So that role was meant to be one of the ways for that continuation or custodianship and, and guaranteeship, if you may. Um, and that's why the whole space of 
Jerusalem in terms of the sequencing of negotiations uh, becomes very important. We try to introduce this very controversial idea of Jerusalem first, but intentionally so, just to challenge the way we think of how we see these uh, ultimate solutions come up. And by that, I mean, how do we imagine Jerusalem working for everyone if, if that is the main sticking point? So it was, at least it's a good exercise. Um, whether or not you'll have an active Jordanian role other than intelligence sharing and security over, over Jerusalem, I don't know. I, I, I can't imagine uh, seeing that, but certainly not to the extent that we saw in the Trump plan uh, where it's relegated to something like a, a, a travel agency or something like that. Yes, it remains to be seen with Palestinian elections if Israel will allow uh, elections in Jerusalem as a test of democracy credentials. Okay. Further I, question? Yeah, go ahead. I, I, I just, I do want to echo this point that Dalia said that we really have a serious challenge with democracy right now uh, in the sense that if, if so it, it, it follows that it's democracy and rule of law. If we start sort of slipping into this authoritarian approach, it, it really, it's going to affect how we conceive of statehood in general. Okay, thank you. I, question? I, I just wanted to say yeah. that the, oh, democracy, on democracy, um, now that I think about it, you know, we had a list of 10 items that people rank ordered. We, it's too bad we didn't have democracy on the Palestinian list. Uh, um, if we did this again, I think we would definitely put on there. I'd also just like to point out that on the issue of erosion of democracy in Israel, uh, Dali has written actually an excellent article <laughs> that covers this in quite, in, quite de in quite a bit of detail, which uh, people might want to look up. Thank you. And there's more coming because I'm working on another longish piece about it. Wonderful. Let us know. <laughs> Next question. Uh, the peace plan developed under Trump is being implemented. It brings peace. It has funded $50 billion. It leads to a Palestinian state that would be recognized by all. New generation in the Arab countries want peace uh, with Israel and for the moment are willing to pay for a Palestinian state. If this plan fails, will the next generation in the Arab countries still be interested in the matter? Isn't this the final and best solution for the Palestinians? Uh, let me start on that. And, and again, maybe Malik can have some comments on, on the attitudes uh, in, the, in the Gulf that, that led to the Abrahamic Accords. Uh, it, it seems to me that um, uh, the, the, the peace plan, the Trump peace plan, was an economics first peace plan. And, uh, and that is what uh, our work shows uh, is not likely to be successful. Uh, we didn't, obviously, we began this study before the, 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 um, uh, the Trump plan ever emerged, although it was trailed for, for a long time before. And what we were trying to say also kind of reaches back to the previous conversation that it's important when we talk about a holistic uh, effort to, to uh, solve the problem, it's holistic in terms of the issue coverage. It isn't just about trade barriers. It isn't just about recognition. It isn't just about one thing or another. It's everything. Um, and also, it's not just the elites that are gonna negotiate this. That, that uh, any study of state building and, 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 and settlement of fundamental disputes uh, over history, I mean, you know, look at the Versailles Treaty in 1919, you cannot solve these things only w on a sustainable basis, only with uh, elite opinion and, and, and a big negotiation table. You need, to, uh, you need to demonstrate, you need to communicate to the population, the general population, uh, and they need to support the effort, particularly when an effort requires some compromises and uh, a, a change in attitude. Mali? I completely agree. I don't have anything to add. Okay, very good. Let's move on to another subject, maybe. Jeff? Sure. 
uh, in a previous study that we did at RAND uh, about the Middle East conflict, the two-state solution was the most profitable solution for both peoples, but it has not really uh, been followed. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's essentially the story of how we came to this. When we, when we did the previous, the, 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 what you're referring, what the questioner is referring to is the so-called cost of conflict uh, study that mm -hmm. we did uh, a few years ago. And when, uh, when we put it out, it got a lot of attention because it showed some really big economic gains to solution, a, a two-state solution. Um, and uh, and costs if if if, if we're, we're, there were to be a return to violence and, and, and so forth, and uh, the critics said I think fairly that look you guys you came up with this thing but you, you didn't ever look at a one state solution you didn't look at confederation you didn't look at confederation you you, you only the only alternative to a two state solution was either violence or um, uh, or status quo. Uh, so we thought, well, that's right, we ought to do that, but we really couldn't do an economic analysis of all these other alternatives because they were so vague. Uh, uh, and, uh, and anyway, uh, the problems weren't fundamentally economic. Uh, we also heard uh, from many, including Israelis, who said, this isn't an economic problem. This is about you know sovereignty, power, governance, uh, et cetera. And uh, while it's nice to know that we can uh, turn the dials this way or that way and make uh, people on the West Bank better off, that's not going to solve their problems, and that's not going to solve our problems. Uh, so that's why we that that was the thinking behind uh, the design of this new study. Thank you. Any more comments or uh, other questions? Well, there's one about refugees. Uh, question is whether the report looked at the refugee issue. Uh, Daniel, uh, Ross, um, uh, we did. Uh, but I, think, I think Daniel's the best person to answer that. Yeah, Daniel's the best. Uh. Uh, we, we addressed the refugee issue in two ways. One is uh, in each of the alternatives we did discuss what would happen with the refugees. And per the previous discussion, we followed how other people have described these alternatives. You know, the two-state solution provides pretty specific guidance, you know, how that would be adjudicated. Uh, the second way we discussed refugees is we asked people to prioritize how important the refugee issue was um, with both the Israeli communities as well as the Palestinians. I'm sure, I don't know if you want to add anything on that issue. I think that one thing that was a bit surprising was that the refugee issue was less important um, than I think we thought it might be going in. You know, it did not rank, you know, among the Palestinians, it was not a top five issue. And among the Israelis, I think it was one of the least important issues in terms of things that they are concerned about. Thank you. Uh, Shira, you want to say something about it? Um, I, know I, I agree with Daniel. I, we have to say that had we done the study within uh, groups of Palestinian refugees, uh, yeah. whether the, in the West Bank or in Gaza, oh, we the population, and of course the diaspora when we talk about yeah. outside mm -hmm. in Lebanon, we would have found uh, something different. This is a very meaningful, it's a very large uh, population. Um, but, but yes, it was not an issue uh, that came up. Uh, we of course described it, but uh, it wasn't prominent in the discussion. So no, no focus group with uh, refugees. No. no okay. Not as far as we know. Yeah. Well, just uh, no focus group with refugees. But if you you did focus groups in Gaza, correct? Yes, we did. Well, I mean, we eighty percent of Gazans come from refugee families, so you may have had. Yeah, some they're all they're all refugees of one right. sort or another, right? Exactly. Right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right, but and, it's, yeah. it's different if you are going to a refugee camp, if you live off a of right. subsidy, right? So, I mean, right, sure. we don't have the, the data explicitly to say. Right. Okay. And we're certainly, we certainly weren't reaching the communities uh, in Lebanon or, or, or somewhere else. Okay. Well, there may be more tension from Europe about this because uh, now Europe is uh, also dealing with the refugee issue. And uh, uh, it would be important to continue to follow up that. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, it's clearly an element. Uh, it's an international element, if nothing else. Yeah, okay. 
Daria, you wanted so, to say something? No, I've said I've said a lot. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir, we thank you for it. Other questions? There, there's a uh, one last question that we have, and uh, uh, I'm looking both at the Q and A and the chat. This one's from Gunvor, noting that uh, Israel is not allowing elections in East Jerusalem. Why is that? Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry I, I could answer, answer that. that. Yeah. Oh, no, no, go ahead. It's clear. It, this is not a true statement. I apologize. I'm sorry. Uh, Israel in the past has allowed elections in East Jerusalem. Yeah. Um, Israel refused to be uh, to be blocking a uh, U.S. Uh, push for democracy, uh, mm -hmm. despite the uh, differences. And I suspect that if it comes around again to holding elections, there could, because it's so politically complicated now, uh, there will be attempts to block it. But the more, if you know Israel well, which I think Dali and I do, um, Israel usually doesn't say no. It says yes, but, and it will mm -hmm. pose so many uh, obstacles that it would be impossible to vote. I also want to point out that in previous Palestinian elections, uh, the voting uh, percentage in Jerusalem, there was no interest in voting by Palestinians. Dalia, I don't know if you have the numbers, but it was uh, single digits, single digits, 3%, 6%, very, very small numbers. So- um, You mean in the municipal elections? No, I'm no. talking about the, the Palestinian right. elections, the, the previous uh, Palestinian elections, 2006, 2005. Right, no, I don't remember the numbers offhand, but I mean, the reason why Israel does single make digits. it difficult is because of the sovereignty issue. Right, right. But it's not that Israel would say oh, we're not um, allowing elections, or at least in the previous, in the past, it uh, didn't happen. Uh, there weren't many opportunities. It's not like there are Palestinian elections. Um, if you're asking about elections in East Jerusalem for the Israeli municipality, then also um, the residents of East Jerusalem, which make 40% of the population, mm -hmm. are uh, able to vote. They are allowed to vote. It's not easy for them to vote, but they can vote. Uh, there's no interest on their part for the sovereignty issue. I, I agree with you. I was part of the observation mission of the EU, and uh, we uh, specifically went to East Jerusalem. There were no official polling stations, but uh, the, the post offices were open for Palestinians to vote. It's, it's correct. So that might be another compromise this time also. Okay. Do Mark, you... it would appear we have answered all of the questions about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict at this point. Okay, well, that's a performance. Um, if I may, then uh, we could close, but uh, uh, I would like to ask uh, the, the speakers if they have final comments, and uh, we could do a rapid round of uh, everybody, and then uh, close the, uh, the session. Charlie, you uh... want to well, uh, Dahlia has to leave us, and I want to thank her very much uh, uh, for her uh, contribution to this conversation and to the study as a whole. I, I don't know whether you have a last minute, but you do have another obligation, so I appreciate that. Yes, thank you. I, I have a 615 obligation. I'm, I'm sorry, but I really feel very privileged to have been part of this, so thank you for including me in the process. Thank, thank you, you for, for do, doing so. Very valuable. Uh, bye -bye. And, and Malik, uh, uh, thank you as well. Thank you so much. Uh, I, to me, I, I'm very privileged to be a part of this group. Um, the questions that the pandemic has sort of posed in my mind is, is really connects to governance in relation to statehood. Um, I just wonder with, with you know, the, 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 the successful implementation of vaccine deployment in Israel, how would that work? versus how what would happen in the Palestinian sort of uh, uh, communities. And uh, I find that an interesting issue if we look at it as a territorial uh, problem um, and forces us to think about, you know, alternatives to the alternatives as well. Thank you. Danielle, you want to make a final comment? Nothing specific, though I would just raise, you know, I, I, I want to speak to Dahlia's comment, and it's unfortunate she's had to go, uh, but the difference between polling and focus groups, you know, we absolutely think that polling is, you know, critical, provides a critical role for understanding how trends are evolving, 
but to her comments, you know, the deep contextual discussions helps us understand you know, where the challenges are um, with the two-state solution, with the Confederation, with others. You know, we had hoped, you know, when we set off to do this, we'd hope that that deep contextual discussion would help us offer those other alternatives that Malik was describing, you know, these alternatives to alternatives. And I think the, our key finding in many ways is that there's so little trust and there's so much fear right now that you can't get to those alternatives. You know, even the alternatives that people want, they don't believe that they're possible. Um, and, and, you know, we're hopeful that, you know, that leadership, international leadership and domestic leadership will help push people in the right direction to help start building those bridges again. But it does seem like there's a pretty monumental task. And I think, you know, everyone is aware of that. But I just want to reiterate it. Okay, thank you. Shira, famous last, last words. Um, no, just to Malik's point about the vaccination rollout, I think it's such a critical issue, right? People are in the Geneva Convention and what are the moral responsibilities, but there's also populations that interact and issues of uh, equity in general when it comes to health where there was a cooperation or not. I don't want to put a plug in for our next study, but we do have a small initiative now at uh, RAN. Uh, we are looking exactly at this um, uh, uh, sort of maybe interim lessons learned from cooperation and coordination around the COVID uh, pandemic at the beginning, and then the lack of during the cessation of coordination uh, due to the annexation threat. And now, again, this issue, and if this can offer a constructive, uh, constructive path forward. Um, so hopefully we'll have something interesting to say within a very few months. It's supposed to be a very, uh, uh, you know, not as extensive as this study, but but uh, timely and really important one. So I thank you for being here. Thank you, thank you. Uh, if there are no more questions or no more comments. Can I, can, yeah, I, yeah, I want to just pick Sorry. up on the, on the on the health issue. And in some senses, it's interesting because the, the work in this re area really began before the studies that we're talking about as a result of the, the kind gift that the Richards provided to look at health as a, uh, as foreign policy or health as a bridge to peace. And uh, Rand actually has done some other studies on, in, the, in the area of uh, uh, gaming exercises between the Israelis, the Palestinians, and the Lebanese to try to look at, at, the, at the time we're looking at the avian flu. And it came up with, uh, you know, information where the, the parties were, were pleased to, to share the information among themselves. But it also emphasized the need for coordination uh, in some areas where, um, frankly, uh, infectious diseases don't recognize any borders at all. So in some senses, we've come all the way around. And, and I do think that coordination and work in healthcare and areas like that will, will help the education process and be able to bridge some of these, these problems with trust. Uh, at least that is, that is one mechanism that worldwide has it's tended to be successful. So. Uh, I hope that uh, the, the study that Shira is doing now will point out some of the ways that, uh, th that people can build on, on things that are in common to all peoples. Okay, thank you, Ross. Uh, Jeffrey, you told me there are more questions? Yes, if you, if you want to take the time now, we could also offer to handle that Five. offline. Five. Five minutes. So, okay, five minutes, okay. Uh, one is whether the, uh, we touched on this a bit earlier about economic co cooperation, but uh, a little more detail here, is the existing future potential economic cooperation an important factor in the negotiations, uh, the added value of each, of each other? Who has a comment on that? Charlie, maybe I can. Do you want me to answer this one, Charlie? Yeah, yeah okay. go for it. So he, uh, in, in one of the participants uh, happily uh, mentioned our previous study that was called Cost of Conflict that talked about the economic benefits of cooperation and two-state solution. And I would say what we, what we found there in our conversations with folks was that, well, maybe economics is not the most important thing. Uh, and that was part of the reason we did this study. And, and certainly on the Palestinian side, one of the things we found was economics was uh, the least important factor for them. You know, security, sovereignty, identity issues were, you know, trumped all other concerns for at least the Palestinian side. Uh, so potentially 
Um, it, could, it could support things, but it's not the most important factor. Okay, thank you. I hear no more questions or no more comments. There's one last. When one, one sees last. the att- go, ahead. go ahead. When one sees the attendance of the recent burial uh, of the the, the Rabi, uh, yeah, it is. It is clear the force of the or- uh, rabbi. I think is what's meant there. It is clear the force of the Orthodox community knows no frontiers, and all is permitted. For electoral reasons, it's an accommodation of governance and convenience. So this is more a comment than a question. Okay, we'll take that in. Uh, and if there are no more questions, I would like to thank everybody for participating. Uh, thank you to the Rand Corporation for taking the time to use Egmont as a platform in Europe, in Brussels. Uh, it's a remarkable study, and uh, we we need more uh, elaboration, certainly, about that. Uh, and I think uh, uh, my own personal view is that a transatlantic uh, discussion and dialogue about it would be very important. My experience of the Middle East peace process has been that when Americans and Europeans work together, uh, they achieve uh, a lot. Uh, Of course, you cannot force the parties to make peace, but uh, certainly the international guarantees that uh, are underlined in your study show that uh, a new commitment will be necessary. And uh, we're looking forward to work with the new US administration to make that happen. Uh, Charlie, you want to make some uh, final comments? And, uh, well, you, yes, uh, thank you very much uh, uh, to, to you, Mark, and to Egmont um, uh, for all of your interest and support in this, uh, this entire research uh, agenda. I agree completely with your um, uh, idea about transatlantic uh, cooperation on this. I uh, said in another context yesterday that I thought that what uh, the first step for the new administration should be. I'm, they're not consulting me, but if they did, I would say it would be to go to Europe and to develop uh, a common understanding of what is possible and what should be done now uh, and stay in close uh, coordination with uh, our European friends and allies in order to support um, uh, progress and a, a settlement of this uh, of this conflict. So that's that's very much why we wanted to present this research uh, in Brussels uh, to obviously an international audience, but from Brussels, uh, we believe very firmly that transatlantic cooperation is a very, very important, if not essential element uh, of the solution. Okay, well, thank you very much and good luck for the future. Uh, We look forward to continuing work with you. Uh, Let me thank the audience for uh, a lively debate. Let me thank all the participants, uh, the speakers for uh, enlightening us. And uh, thank you also to the technical teams for making this uh, webinar work work smoothly. A special Uh, thanks also to Malik. Yeah. Thank you, Malik. Thank you. So uh, until next time, uh, stay safe uh, and stay well. Uh, we look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.